class. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, speak to this audience. Uh, I'm tr trying to share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. It is visible. Right. Uh, good evening, good night, whichever part of the world you are. Uh, my presentation over the next 30 minutes or so would be on breast reconstruction. Pardon me if I'm sticking on to the basics. One minute. Can I proceed with the presentation? Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. See, the aim of a breast reconstruction is to make it look, feel as much as a breast as possible. If both breasts are being removed, your aim is to make a woman happy and confident with her restored shape. Why should we reconstruct the breast? Throughout the history and across the continents and across different cultures, even when mutilated otherwise. Breast has been a symbol of womanhood. This is a fantastic architecture from South India where the depictions are really great. Why should we reconstruct? Not for mere restoration of the curves. First, we want to look and we want to be normal. There is a sense of mutilation and distress which goes on after removing the breast. There's an emotional loss, this loss of self-confidence. More than anything else, it's a daily reminder to the patient per se that she does not have part of the breast. There are various etiologies to these. It could be from congenital or acquired varieties. Among the congenital common ones are pollens and tuberous breast deformities, acquired malignancies, burns, infectious disease, trauma. My concentration on this presentation would be towards post-malignancy breast reconstruction, though I would touch upon here and there about other conditions. This is a classic example of a pollen syndrome. You can see a hypoplastic chest wall, hypoplastic breast on the right side. You can see the hand also. The size of the fingers are small. This is called as brachydactyly. The mid and ring finger are together. This is sim brachydactyly. This is a classical example of a pollen syndrome. You can have something called like a tuberous breast deformity where the breast has developed, but it has developed in different pattern where people would like to look a little bit better or a better breast is required for them. Burns will also destroy breast, part of the breast, complete breast, different age groups, and more often than not with self immolation being the common cause. This could be seen in young women who would want for a breast reconstruction. Malignancy across ages, unilateral, bilateral, different causes where breast reconstruction is required. Sometimes, in developing countries, we find infection, raw areas, a lot of them, which would also require a reconstruction. The basic preoperative evaluation that we do is we want to evaluate clinically what is available in the chest wall, the skeletal system, pectoralis major, the muscular component, the soft tissue component, which would be the breast tissue, the skin envelope, the amount of skin that is available, the nipple area complex, which is very, very important in reconstruction. We need to know the quality of tissues as well, if previous radiotherapy has been given or not. You need to examine the opposite breast because we are trying to get some symmetry. If we are going to bring in tissue from elsewhere, we need to look at the donor site also. What are the aims of our reconstruction? The goals of our reconstruction is to get appropriate position of the breast, appropriate shape, appropriate contour. We need to create an inframammary fold. We need to create a nipple area complex and we need to maintain the symmetry. <clears throat> These are old concepts of reconstruction. First, initially to begin with, what you're seeing here is the first reconstruction when a mastectomy was done on the left side from the right, they have shifted the breast to the left side. These are old concepts. Then they tried to use the pectoralis minor muscle. This is by Morestin and this is by Omrudan. This is Ombrodon that you're seeing in the picture. He used the pectoralis minor to form some small mound. He used a flap to cover it. The modern era of reconstruction, that is history. Now we don't follow all those. What we are following now is as it progressed, it started with a silicon gel prosthesis, then a tissue expander, 
then different kinds of flaps started coming. Our choices are autologous reconstruction, implants, a combination of these two, or a fat grafting. Among the autologous, we have a pedicle transfer and a free tissue transfer, which means a microsurgical reconstruction is being done. Uh, the other, other, other than malignancy, the other conditions for which we are doing a breast reconstruction. For here, example, you can see here, Pollen syndrome can happen in men as well as women. Depending on what is the requirement, you just require only an implant to match it. Sometimes there is deficiency of significant deficiency of muscle and bone where you need to bring in some more muscle. We can use a pedicle latissimus dorsi to cover it up. Tuberous breast deformity, one of the difficult conditions to treat. Here we tend to put periolar, peri areolar incisions. We raise a superiorly based flap. We have three separate pedicles, put an implant inside, wrap it up with these pedicles. The implant is subfacial. That means below the pectoralis, fascia covering the pectoralis major. Then you cover it up with these three pedicles. You get a reasonably good shape. You also try and create the inframammary fold. Burns, one of the difficult things to treat because there is loss of tissue, there is change in color. So many things happen. Here in this patient example, what you're seeing is a tissue deficiency. Here, you need to restore the deficient tissue deficiency as well as maintain the contour or shape of the breast, retain the nipple area lock complex. So here, the reconstruction has been done with a pedicled latissimus torsi muscle flap. Malignancy, this is the topic that we are going to concentrate on. Pardon me if I'm sticking to the basics. Some basics about malignancy in relation to reconstruction is going to be told here. Uh, these might have been repeated in the previous presentations, but I would like to reinforce some certain things which are related to plastic surgery. So if these are things which you might already know, but still I would like to reinforce it. There are certain independent risk factors which could include early menarche, late menopause, first full-term pregnancy. There is a family history of malignancy. All these people are prone for malignancy. There's a personal history of breast cancer. Well, one side, the patient might have a breast cancer, the opposite side can develop. Majority of them are sporadic, about less than one percentage have got mutations, BRCA1 and 2, as you know. There are different molecular profiles, depending on the hormone receptor status, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor. The human epidermal growth factor receptor profile also has to be taken into account. All of these are negative, which means that it has got a high proliferation rate malignancy is going to grow. All these biopsies are very, very important when you plan for a reconstruction. Are you planning? When are you planning? What are you planning to do? Uh, <clears throat> apart from the breast-related cancer antigen 1 and 2, there are a list of antigens which can predispose the patient to malignancy. The basic problem is the DNA double strand break repair. They have elevated risk for other malignancies. This has to be kept in mind when you plan for a reconstruction. Sometimes uh, you need to look at other things also before you plan for a reconstruction. The diagnosis established, generally there are two categories of people who come with symptoms. They have clinical signs and symptoms. They have uh, recognizable disease. Some do not have disease. You pick them up by a screening mammography. I believe, still believe clinical examination is the most important way of establishing a diagnosis of cancer breast, not just the diagnosis, but also look at associated lymph node basins, distant metastasis. Despite all the imaging modalities that you have, clinical examination is the most important thing. What elements that you would like to look? You would like to look at the parenchyma, the nipple area complex, the skin envelope, the, the draining lymph nodes, and look for distant metastasis. The diagnostic imaging is, as usual, standard mammography, ultrasonography, and MRI. Ultrasound mammography, you take, this is a highly effective screening modality. You have two views. One is the mediolateral, another is the craniocaudal view. There is a standard scoring system by rats. Four and five indicate more in favor of malignancy. So this certainly will require an intervention. Ultrasonography essentially can be used for guidance of biopsy, or if there are some small cysts, you can evacuate it. MRI is not a routinely used tool. It is a reserve tool, essentially. This is for screening patients at high risk for breast cancer. If you think that these patients have deleterious 
breast related cancer antigen mutation then you do it if there is axillary node metastasis and an unknown primary then you can do an mri why we are hesitating to do mri one it's got a prohibitive cost second it is less specific some of these findings may not be matching with the malignancy and there is a limited availability the other things that you would like to look at is <coughs> uh, histologic modalities either a core needle biopsy or an fnac the advantage of a core biopsy is there is minimal scar and subsequent in case it turns out to be non malignant subsequent mammograms will not be affected by this core biopsy significantly there is a decreased pain significantly decreased cost because when you think in terms of doing an open biopsy the cost is more compared to a core biopsy now core biopsy has progressed significantly well you use a 18 or 8 to 14 gauge needle you can do it under stereotactic or sonographic guidance the accuracy of vacuum assisted breast biopsy now core biopsies are done with vacuum you can you get sufficient good amount of tissue this tissue is good for making a diagnosis and also analyzing the receptor status it is almost approaching 100 percentage accuracy excision biopsy is done when there is a discrepancy you have a clinical picture which is discrepant with the radiographic and histologic findings things like that happen then you plan for an excision biopsy the factors that would influence on the decision for surgery essentially it is the breast size to the tumor burden stage of the disease these two are quite important multicentricity family history age at the diagnosis all these things are other factors that are important in the decision making for surgery now we are coming to the topic proper a breast conserving surgery some basic definitions on uh, surgeries that are done for breast malignancy i just am sticking on to the basics because once you understand the basics the application of plastic surgery could be seen better breast conserving surgery essentially means a partial mastectomy followed by adjuvant radiotherapy this mastectomy could be lumpectomy quadrantectomy segmentectomy whichever it is usually curvilinear incisions are made this area is called as the keyhole area so you try and use linear incisions in these area as you go to upper quadrant, you can radially orient the incisions. You have to dissect circumferentially around the tumor, ensure that the negative margins are there, and then you try to remove the safest minimal volume of tissue. Here, the lumpectomy cavity is re-excised prior to closure if the margins are doubtful. Still in doubt, don't plan for a reconstruction. A breast conserving surgery is aimed at reconstruction at the primary sitting. So if you have doubt, delay the reconstruction. Uh, oncoplastic breast reconstruction. This terminology has come into work since 1993. Here we are having the best practices of oncology and best practices of plastic surgery. Okay, the principles of both are taken. Tumor resection, complete tumor resection is important. Reconstruction to the best possible way. The basic principles of plastic surgery like breast reduction or mastopexy are applied in this. You use what is called as a volume displacement technique or a volume replacement technique depending on the volume of breast that you are removing. So the resected volume is generally greater than 20% of the estimated breast volume in these patients on plastic breast surgery when you're planning. You try and use it in breasts which are a little bit larger if there are ptosis. If there is a need for large skin resection in the mammoplasty area, it is preferable if you use it in, if there are tumors in the central medial or inferior region. If there are previous plastic surgery in the breast, you can still use those incisions. The relative contraindications are if the breasts are small, if there is a previous radiation, if the, large, if the skin resection is going to be large beyond the mammoplasty area, if there are comorbid conditions, and if there are unrealistic aesthetic expectations, do not plan for an oncoplastic breast surgery. A cup or a B cup? I, I presume that uh, surgeons over there understand what is this cup size. It, uh, you need to uh, uh, understand this because you need to tell people what kind of uh, inner garments they need to buy for their breasts. Essentially, you want to measure the circumference of the chest at the inframammary area. You want to measure the circumference at the nipple area or complex level. If the circumference of the chest at the inframammary area is around, say, for example, 32 inches, and 
if you measure it at the nipple area or complex, the, dis the difference between them is say about roughly four centimeters. For 32 inches, four centimeters means 32 B cup. If it is six centimeters, every two centimeters adds to a cup, roughly for about 32 size chest circumference. So two centimeters A cup, four centimeters becomes B cup, six centimeters becomes C cup. So if you're going to remove about 15 to 20 percentage of the breast parenchyma in a small volume breast, or 30 percentage or larger, there is going to be a significant distortion in breast oncoplastic surgery is going to be a little tough. Please understand what is this? This is called as Weiss pattern. Okay, uh, this pattern has to be understood because if there are tumor which is there within this Weiss pattern, this principle of oncoplastic surgery could be applied. The uh, type of oncoplastic surgeries could be immediate, it could be delayed immediate, it could be delayed. Immediate means at the time of resection, delayed immediate when you have doubt about the malignancy or when you have doubt about the margins, you want to confirm the margin status, then you take about a one to two weeks after the resection, you ensure that the patient is disease free, then you can plan for a de delayed immediate reconstruction or you can do a delayed reconstruction if the patient has underwent previous radiotherapy. The techniques that are used could be volume displacement or volume replacement, depending on the volume and the location of the tumor. Essentially, if the breast size is small, there is no ptosis of the breast, the defect, depending on the skin or soft tissue or on the volume, if it is a small breast, you use volume replacement, which means that you need to bring in tissue from elsewhere to cover the defect. If it is moderate or a large breast, if there is volume deficiency alone, you can use the existing breast tissue, which is called as volume displacement technique. If there is skin deficiency also, as I said in the previous slide, if it falls within the Weiss pattern, you can use volume displacement technique. If it is outside the Weiss pattern, you need to use the volume replacement technique. The volume displacement technique means you're going to remodel the existing parenchyma. So the size of the breast is going to become smaller, existing breast. Volume replacement techniques, there is insufficient volume. So you're going to bring in tissue from elsewhere. Here you are trying to preserve the volume. Planning uh, the principles of oncoplastic surgery, there are four basic principles. You're going to plan the skin incisions based on reduction mammoplasty or on mastopexy techniques. You're going to reshape the parenchyma, bring it in such a way that the contour of the breast is maintained. You need to reposition the nipple area complex may be low down. You can reposition the nipple area complex after the mastopexy. And then you need to handle the contralateral breast to get some symmetry. Here, the reconstructive goals are preservation of the nipple viability. This is very, very important. You need to ensure the viability of the nipple. If you're going to use the mastopexy or reduction techniques, you need going to reshape the breast mound and whatever dead space is there that needs to be closed after reshaping the breast. Sometimes the tumors are located outside the Weiss pattern. So in which case you can use some local flaps. This could be a transposition flap, this is something called as a half plasty. You can shift it from here. You can shift the tissue down. You'll be able to cover it. Or I do not follow this principle, but this is available. This is called donut mastopexy, tumor very close to the nipple area complex. I don't attempt this, but this option is done by some of them. This is bat wing mastopexy, a little higher up. Again, you're going to use the shape of a bat wing to excise the tumor and then lift the nipple area complex up but any scar that goes outside the nipple area complex transversely into the breast is an unsightly scar. I do not prefer the second and the third ones. The, there are other local flaps that are available like the rhomboid submaxillary flap, the superior inferior thoracodorsal flaps. And then you have the regional flaps, the latissimus dorsi flap, the thoracodorsal artery perforator flaps. All these are perforator flaps which can be used <laughs> there are other adipofacial flaps that are available. Uh, now what we have looked at is conservative breast surgery. What we're going to look at uh, further is mastectomy. This forms the bulk of the disease, bulk of the problems that we are treating. Uh, 
I generally believe that it is impossible to resect all the breast tissue because the breast tissue extends up to the axillary tile. Sometimes it crosses the midline to the other side. Majority of the time, 90 to 95 percentage of the breast tissue is removed on a mastectomy. Whatever is left behind is handled with chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Uh, I, I'm just I'm going to repeat the basics. Please understand the basics so that the reconstruction can be done better. Halstead means it's you're going to remove the breast, skin, pectoralis major, and block resection of level 1, 2, 3 lymph nodes. Total mastectomy, you're going to excise the breast tissue with an ellipse of skin and an epilateral complex. Skin sparing mastectomy. Here, the incision is made circum areolar. The nipple areolar complex is removed. The entire content of the breast tissue is removed. In the nipple sparing total mastectomy, here you see the nipple areolar complex is intact. The scar is, all, wherever the malignancy is, you can use at that place a scar, you can take out all the breast tissue. This is to understand the nomenclatures of mastectomies. In a skin sparing total mastectomy, where do you use it? It is used, where it is an excellent choice for a near complete resection. You, you can create an acceptable breast mound by an implant or a flap because the skin envelope is intact. It preserves the inframammary fold. The native skin envelope is available. It provides an almost excellent match to the contralateral breast in size, shape, and color. You find that the whole breast tissue has been removed along with the nipple areola complex. In a nipple sparing mastectomy, this is primarily indicated for prophylactic mastectomy, mastectomies in highly selective patients, and the tumors have to be far off from the nipple areola complex. This is very, very important. The advantage of the technique is that the point of maximal projection, which is the nipple, is best preserved. Because it is preserved, the reconstruction looks really good. The chances are there is a high local recurrence rate if you have not removed the tumor pro properly. Because the nipple is left behind, cutting all the sensory nerves, there's a lack of nipple sensation. Sometimes nipple necrosis once there is a necrosis, there is an exposure of the implant can happen this way or that way, whichever way. The access could be through the inframammary fold or through the axilla. See, now you see a nipple sparing mastectomy reconstruction done with an implant. It's a two-stage procedure. So first stage, you resect the tumor, put an expander implant because the nipple has got a significantly challenged with its blood supply. So we might lose the nipple. We wait for about a week to 10 days for the nipple to settle down and then plan for a reconstruction. But this is very, very important. Tumor to nipple area complex distance has got to be at least minimum, I, I, I presume it will be more than three centimeters at least. This is ideal for implant-based reconstruction rather than putting a tissue inside. Implant gives excellent symmetry in these patients. Prophylactic mastectomies are done with people who have this predilection for developing breast malignancy. Patients who have unilateral breast cancer, but they want patients desire a contralateral site, then you think of prophylactic mastectomy. It is done similar to either you can do a skin sparing mastectomy or a nipple sparing mastectomy. Modified radical mastectomy, this is the most often done here. You're going to remove the breast tissue along with the lymph nodes of level one and two. Rarely we remove the level three lymph nodes also. The incision is marked in such a way that the tumor is removed and axillary dissection is performed as part of MRM. Nodal evaluation would have been done with a sentinel lymph node dissection. It is performed at the same extirpative procedure. The reconstruction, immediate reconstruction following a mastectomy, I preferably tend to do in patients who have underwent a skin sparing mastectomy. There are two options. Either you can do an autologous free tissue transfer or you can do an implant-based transfer. If it is going to be autologous free tissue, it could be pedicle flaps or it could be free flaps. Uh, autologous tissue transfer are reliable and stable over a period of time. So this obviously gives a better chance compared to implant based. The best possible outcomes after a reconstruction, you tend to see it in a moderate sized breast. If the breasts are going to be very small or very large, the problem is uh, you need to duplicate it compared to the contralateral breast. So symmetry, establishing a symmetry is a very big problem when it is a very small or a very large breast. Moderate size breast is the ideal for a reconstruction. Radiotherapy, this is very, very important. I, I believe all the surgeons should see this slide 
carefully. Apply it before, during, or after reconstruction. Radiotherapy is one of the most destructive things that can happen to tissues. It severely compromises the aesthetic outcome. Whatever reconstruction that you try and do, the impact of radiotherapy is there. Uh, there is an increased scarring. There's a loss of skin coverage. If you put an implant, it can get exposed. If it is a radiotherapy given area, I would delay the reconstruction. I would preferably use a autologous tissue, a well vascularized tissue instead of an implant. Very, very important. Radiotherapy has got very bad effects. You have to be very, very careful when you plan for a reconstruction. Uh, delayed reconstruction. If you delay the reconstruction, what is the pro what are the problems? It is challenging because you're not able to exactly guess how much skin, how much parenchyma is required because symmetry is important. If there is radiation therapy, the complexity increases more. I generally prefer autologous tissue over implant if there is a delayed reconstruction unless the patient specifically asks for it. There are different kinds of patients. Some of them are very happy saying that I just want the disease process to get over. I don't want any further treatment. They don't want any reconstruction at all. Some of them wish to have the best possible aesthetic outcome. They want repeated. They would accept even number of procedures to look better and normal. What needs to be thought about in these secondary procedures are symmetry, nipple complex reconstruction, contralateral balancing procedure, fat grafting, tattoo, all these are secondary procedures that you need to do after a breast reconstruction. What are the options that are available for reconstruction after a total mastectomy? An expander implant reconstruction, an autologous reconstruction, using a pedicle flap or a microsurgical reconstruction. Among the pedicle flaps, we tend to do latissimus dorsi, transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. Among the microsurgical reconstructions, all these options are there. We'll come one by one later on. Here you are seeing an example of a pedicle the latissimus dorsi. This is an RT given tissue. You see the latissimus dorsi skin paddle. Underlying muscle is also taken. This has been swung anteriorly to cover the defect. You find that this is a moderate sized breast. When you try to reconstruct with the latissimus dorsi flap and the skin paddle, this lady is a little bit fat so that this fat adds to the volume here. Generally, a lattice mustache muscle provides just enough tissue to cover. It will not provide so much contour unless the patient is a, has got some more fat and the breast on the on the, uh, of the contralateral side is moderate. You will not get a matching one. Here, you are seeing after removal of the tumor, we have reconstructed the breast with the lattice mustache flap. You can see the implant inside. The implant has been kept because of the previous surgery, the pectoralis fascia is not available. We have kept on top of the pectoralis muscle and then covered it up with the latissimus torsi muscle all around. This is the result. This patient did not want a nipple area complex reconstruction. She is fine. This is a moderate sized breast. You can find that the symmetry is reasonably good. The transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. <coughs> this has been the most popular procedure for reconstruction. There are several variants to it. You can do it as a pedicle flap. You can do it as a free flap. You can anastomose the artery and veins here. Take the tissue, anastomose the artery and veins here. There are several variants to it. You can stack it. You can put it on uh, uh, with some extensions. Here you can see an example of a pedicle tram flap. Okay, generally this is called a transverse rectus abdominis muscle flap. There are four components to it. Uh, the blood supply is coming from this side. This is based on the communication between the inferior epigastric artery of this uh, superior and inferior epigastric artery. On the same side, this skin paddle is called one. On the contralateral side, it's called two. On the <coughs> other side, it's called three, and this is four. Now you find that the blood supply to the area four is a little less. So this usually is discarded. We tend to use this flap. Okay, now this has been taken up, this is covered, but the contralateral breast, you see it's a large one. So when this patient comes up for the subsequent surgery of nipple area complex reconstruction, a reduction mastopexy is also being, reduction mammoplasty has also been done to match it with the contralateral breast. 
Microvascular flaps, what are the advantage of doing microvascular flaps? They have long vascular pedicles. Post, because the vascularity is maintained, the muscle is sometimes uh, retained. The nerve supply is cut. The, uh, <coughs> so sometimes the uh, sufficient bulk is provided by this. There is a decreased donor site mobility, less post-operative pain, swifter single procedure it has been done, swifter rehabilitation is possible if you do a microsurgery. Again, here you are seeing a transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap taken along with the pedicle, and then you can give it to the internal memory artery this side, or you can give it to the uh, uh, thoracic perforators that are coming over here. That is, in a patient with a tram flap, we tend to take the muscle along with this. These are the perforator flaps here. When we say it is a perforator flap, it means that we are going to use the vessel we're not going to sacrifice the muscle. So muscle is preserved. There are different perforator flaps that are available for breast reconstruction, construction, depending on the size of the breast that you want to reconstruct. And depending on the area in which you would like to uh, harvest the scar the patient wants to have, if there are previous scars in the abdomen, then you try and take it to the other places. This is a deep inferior epigastric artery perforator flap that has been taken. You can see the vessel that is going in. Here you can see this is post radiotherapy breast. We are trying to take a flap like this. You can see there is a small extension over here. A finally well settled flap can be seen. This is deep inferior epigastric artery perforator flap. This is done as a free flap, microsurgery. You can see the vessel here, the muscle here, muscle has been retracted. You can see the muscle completely retracted. You can see a complete flap over there. Sometimes when bilateral mastectomies are done, then you can plan for a bilateral deep inferior epigastric artery perforator flap. On both sides, it can be harvested. I tend to take it to the opposite side. I tend to take an anastomosis here rather than taking on the internal mammary artery. You can see that bilateral reconstruction. If, when it is a bilateral reconstruction, symmetry is possible. And if the patient is comfortable with a small or a moderate size breast, this gives a very good option. The other options are superficial inferior epigastric artery flap. Okay, here we are taking the superficial inferior epigastric artery, but I tend to prefer to take it on both sides because the volume of tissue that it supplies is a little less. So you need to take both sides superficial inferior epigastric artery and take a bigger flap. Here, what has been harvested is a superficial inferior epigastric artery flap. You can see the results. You can try and get it in a moderate size press. All these are fit for a moderate size press without any contralateral mastopexy. This is a superior gluteal. This I have not performed. This is an option that is available. People who would like to take it, who have sufficient tissue at the back where it can be harvested. This is called superior gluteal artery perforator flap. You can use it for reconstruction of the breast. These kind of reconstructions are okay for a small to moderate size breasts. Here you can see the reconstruction that has been done. Another option is an inferior gluteal artery perforator flap. You can see the difference in the buttock. You can see the small difference that is happening. You can harvest it based on the inferior gluteal artery perforator. And here an implant has been added to the volume of tissue to increase the volume of tissue. This is called as a profunda artery perforator flap. Here, you can see the markings over here. This is based on the perforator which is coming from the profunda artery. This can be used to reconstruct. This is ideally suited for small size breasts. This is called as the transverse upper gracilis flap. See here, the gracilis muscle is taken. The perforator along with that has been harvested. This is used for small reconstruction, central reconstruction. You would see the results. The flap has been folded on itself and this gives a mound and this has been an anastomosed. This is a free flap, which means microsurgery has been done, artery to artery, vein to vein anastomosis has been done. This is after the reconstruction. Almost we can get a symmetry, nipple complex matching. The rotation of the flap will give the appearance of elevated nipple that you could see over here. So this is after the reconstruction with a transverse upper gracilis flap. Why microvascular flaps? I'm trying to reinforce it again because it is versatile. You can take it from many places. 
you will have sufficient tissue that is available. When radiotherapy has been given, if the vessels are available for anastomosis, then this is ideally suitable because this is going to bring in healthy blood supply to that area, the contour and the shape will change. This gives superior aesthetic results. In the long run, this is less expensive because it's a single procedure. Fat grafting, <laughs> this is an option that is being thought about now. This is only to correct small changes. Okay, this is to correct the contour deformities. You can, if there are some ripples in the implant that you have put, you can correct it with a graft. You can fill the hollowing of the upper pole, some of them who request for it. If there are scars, you can put a graft over there, fair fat graft. You can fill the lumpectomic defect. It can be used for augmentation or increasing the volume. The reconstruction of entire breast, I am a bit doubtful. Still, we have not reached up to the stage. What we tend to do is we'll harvest the graft, deposit the fat in multiple small deposits are done. It is done in multiple layers. It is done in multiple directions and it is done in multiple rounds. It is not done with one sitting, you will get the whole breast. No, it is not possible. So we tend to do it in multiple sittings. If it is an irradiated bed, the number of rounds that are required to do fat grafting goes up. What the advantage of this is that women like contouring from liposuction, which means the donor site also becomes a little bit better it can improve an irradiated tissue. If the radiation, if the patient has underwent radiation, it can improve the irradiated tissue. The fat will give got a better quality skin on top of it. Reconstructing the nipple areola complex. This is very, very important. Nipple areola complex is considered to be the signature of the breast or the eyes of the breast. The breast looks like a breast only after the nipple areola complex has been reconstructed. It is always a challenge. It is not easy to reconstruct the nipple areola complex particularly in Asians, African community, where you want to get the good color of their native, uh, comparing it with the Europeans and the Americans, the breast, the uh, color that you get with the nipple area complex is a little different from what we have. The reconstruction could be done, usually I tend to do it about three to six months after the breast reconstruction. For the nipple, I tend to use what is called as a CV flap or a skate flap that you saw in the previous picture. The nipple alone is, get, is getting, a, once it is like that, now it becomes like that and gradually it starts elevating. For the areola, you can put a full thickness skin graft. This graft can be harvested. Uh, I tend to harvest it from the labia, uh, which gives almost a good color match, or you can do a tattoo. Tattoo has now become uh, exceedingly good tattoos are available, and uh, but that fits more into European and American class. Now, what you are seeing here, this is what is happening now. This is a tattoo. Believe me, this is a tattoo. This is a 3D tattoo. It looks now 3D drawings and arts have come. So this looks almost like a normal nipple area complex. What are the complications of breast reconstruction? You will have pain, discomfort. You can you can have partial losses. You can have complete losses, infection. Implant can get exposed, you can have implant leakage, you can have asymmetry. All complications are possible. Would you like to reconstruct immediately or would you like to delay the reconstruction? This is a challenging question to be answered. Immediate reconstruction, if it is an early breast cancer, I would plan for an immediate reconstruction. You have to exclude nodal disease, post-op RT is not required. What this does is it is very psychologically beneficial to the patient because the skin envelope is intact. Reconstruction looks all, makes it look almost normal. The native inframammary fold is also easily delineated. It is less costly because it goes as a single procedure. Delayed, there are indications for delayed reconstructions. Advanced stage, most of the patients that are, who are coming to us come at an advanced stage. Where a requirement of RT or chemo is there, a delayed reconstruction is a better option. If there are other conditions, like if the patient is a smoker or other comorbid conditions, you can delay the reconstruction. In conclusion, I would like to say there are many, many options for reconstruction for women in, uh, who are diagnosed with breast cancer. You, there's got to be a discussion between the patient, the breast surgeon and the plastic surgeon, because either it is breast conserving therapy or mastectomy, Discussing with a plastic surgeon offers you an increase in uh, patient satisfaction because he would like to, all possible options he would be able to uh, give to the patient as well as the other consultants. It is an eloquent field. Uh, <clears throat> more often than not, we tend to see 
a little advanced stage malignancy in which case whenever feasible a free flap is a best option among the free flap the deep inferior epigastric artery perforator flap fits in well because it is versatile it is safe and it provides a good reconstruction it gives excellent results donor site patient is very happy most of the time in the donor site thank you very much if there are any questions i am ready to take it Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rithar, for this very nice and elegant presentation. Uh, now, if anyone have any question, please unmute yourself or raise hand. Ask I hope, that. I hope I have lived up to your expectations on my presentation. anyone have any question please unmute yourself and ask question directly can i stop sharing my screen yes yes dr alamin you are welcome dr alamin thank you sir for this nice lecture just uh, it is very informative and very nice uh, i need you to clear for me that uh, kind of uh, synthetic reconstruction of saline field uh, port and uh, uh, to inflate uh, the uh, subvectoral space. Uh, I need uh, you to clear this for me. Well, I, I don't understand your question. Can you uh, better frame it? You want to know about the saline field implant. Am I right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, see, if whenever you're trying to do a skin sparing mastectomy, all right, you want to retain the skin is in skin envelope is intact. You want to retain the space that has been where the tissue has been removed. You want to retain the space before ensuring a complete reconstruction. So you put an implant, saline based implant inside. You keep injecting it and maintain the volume. This acts both as a hemostasis as well as maintaining the skin envelope. If you have ensured the patient is completely disease free, you can take away the expander and put in a permanent implant. Yeah, we, we put silicone after that. Silicone, we use silicone after yeah, that. There are, there are, yeah, I, I tend to use it that way. I tend to put a silicone implant. There are expander implants available, which comes as a single stage where you can, uh, you expand it over a period of time detach the tube out, leave the implant inside, cell and implants. In our place, we tend to remove the cell and implants that we have put and put in a silicone implant. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we are welcome Dr. Vikas Jan, who is present for us the previous lecture about early breast cancer. You are okay. highly welcome. Yeah, Dr. Vikas Jain, I can see his name over there. Thank you, sir. I was just <laughs> listening the lecture. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Nice speaking to you. I hope uh, the oncology part of it was I try to maintain it basic because at least this I need to tell when I'm trying to reconstruct the breast. I hope the, that part of the yes, uh, presentation was correct. Yeah, definitely, sir. It was nice. <laughs> Very informative. Yeah. 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 Dr. Thank Hala. you very much. Yeah. Dr. Hala, yeah. you are welcome. Dr. Hala. Hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I'm Hala, registrar of yeah. plastic surgery. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this nice presentation. I really enjoy it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have two questions here. Yeah. Uh, the first one, what about uh, the flap, abdominal flap, so either medical or free flap after liposuction? If we did a liposuction for a lady, then we need to reconstruct heart press or something like that. 
does like this action affect these flaps or it's not there's no problem with that no and if a liposuction has been done previously generally yeah, yeah. i do not harvest this tram flaps if a liposuction has been done previously which means that okay. multiple layers the cannula has gone in uh, yeah. there is fibrosis over there and uh, what happens is the survival may not be a problem but the reconstructed breast may not have the contour that we are expecting so we tend to take other tissues if liposuction has been done previously okay okay uh, yeah. and and i need to ask you if we have benign condition for the breast like huge breast with bilateral fibro multiple fibroadenomas i have i met such a case last yeah. week bilateral multiple fibroadenomas and yeah. um, we do we need to do such like your reconstruction option or what to do regarding her condition she is too young she's 16 year old and she has this huge breast with multiple fibroadenomas bilaterally i'm really confused how to help her yeah i think um, i think dr vikas jain is also on the show so he might be the right person to talk about what needs to be generally what i tend benign, to do is benign. if, if yeah, if these are benign condition, but these it are multiple. Benign. If it is yeah. huge and it is disturbing to the patient, I believe I will yeah. always wait till about 18 years when the patient can take her own decision unless and until it is going to be significantly affecting her lifestyle. Okay, mm -hmm. if it is going to be huge enough, she's not able to wear her dresses, has got a big shoulder pain, neck pain, all other factors come into play. So uh, if that condition is there, certainly reconstruction is required, but we need to yes. speak to their parents as well to make a decision on what kind of a reconstruction they would make. Because right here, over here in India, I think uh, we need to be very careful when we are touching breasts of unmarried women, uh, because yeah. over a yeah. period of time, you know, there are so many factors that come into play. So yes. when it is a huge fibroadenoma or when you believe that this can turn malignant, like... Uh, uh, mm, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so those yeah. kinds of conditions, it will require a, a reconstruction. The advantage of those is the skin envelope is available. When the skin yes. envelope is available, it is easier to reconstruct with a implant. But to maintain symmetry, if it is bilateral, then we are lucky. If it is unilateral, then it is challenging because an implanted she breast has, will obviously, bilateral. yeah, if it is bilateral, you are lucky. If it is unilateral, then it is a big challenge because putting an implant on one side and trying to match it with the contralateral side is uh, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Vikas, Dr. Vikas, I think you have an addition. Yeah, I, yeah. I just think that whatever is the symptomatic lump, that only is to be removed. Uh, otherwise, yes. uh, don't do anything until yeah. uh, uh, she uh, gets an adequate age for that. Uh, small lumps, so we don't need to do anything for that until unless it's symptomatic. Only the large lump, which is causing uh, symptoms for, to the girl, that only can be excised and that also only through the nipple areola complex, the junction of skin and the nipple areola complex. Yeah. Either you use a periorealer, yeah, periorealer, yeah, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. If we have no more question, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Treat her for this very elaborative session as well as Dr. Vikas in the previous lecture. And also we thank all of the international speaker, uh, international participant, as well as our Sudanese resident and Sudanese serum. Uh, Dr. Treat her, uh, if you have any comment. Also. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. Hope uh, I am able to express myself in a way that you can understand and hope uh, it was beneficial to everyone over there. Thank you very much. It is really, it is really benefit all of us. And we hope to see you in next session, talk to us about skin malignancies and it is reconstruction if you have yeah. extra time. When are we likely to have this session? 
we arrange with you sir yeah thank you very much see okay uh, thank you. Uh, it would be a pleasure for me to speak to you thank you very much thank you all of you thank you thank, thank you thank you